It was about six weeks before I left Madurai for good, and the great change in my life took place. It was quite sudden. I was sitting alone in a room on the first floor of my uncle's house. I seldom had any sickness, and on that day there was nothing wrong with my health. But a sudden, violent fear of death overtook me. There was nothing in my state of health to account for it and I did not try to account for it or to find out whether there was any reason for the fear. I just felt I am going to die, and began thinking of what to do about it. It did not occur to me to consult the doctor or my elders or friends. I felt that I had to solve the problem myself, there and then. The shock of the fear of death drove my mind inwards, and I said to myself, mentally, without actually framing the words, Now death has come. What does it mean? What is it that is dying? The body dies, and I at once dramatized the occurrence of death. I lay with my limbs stretched out stiff, as though rigor mortis had set in, and imitated a corpse so as to give greater reality to the inquiry. I held my breath, and kept my lips tightly closed, so that no sound could escape, so that neither the word I nor any other word could be uttered. Well then, I said to myself, this body is dead. It will be carried stiff to the burning ground, and there burnt and reduced to ashes. But with the death of this body, am I dead? Is the body I? It is silent and inert. But I feel the full force of my personality and even the voice of the I within me apart from it. So I am spirit transcending the body. The body dies, but the spirit that transcends it cannot be touched by death. That means I am the deathless spirit. All this was not dull thought. It flashed through me vividly as living truth which I perceived directly, almost without thought process. I was something very real, the only real thing about my present state, and all the conscious activity connected with my body was centered on that I. From that moment onwards, the I or self focused attention on itself by a powerful fascination. Fear of death had vanished once and for all. Absorption in the self continued unbroken from that time on. I had read no books, except the Peria Puranam, the Bible in bits of Tayumanavar, or Theravaram. My conception of Iswara was similar to that found in the Purunas. I had never heard of Brahman, Samsara, and so forth. I did not yet know there was an essence or impersonal real underlying everything, and that Iswara and I were both identical with it. Later at Tiruvanamali, as I listened to the Ribhu Gita and other sacred books, I learned all this, and found that the books were analyzing and naming what I had felt intuitively without analysis or name. Buddha is said to have ignored questions about God. Yes, and because of this he has been called an agnostic. In fact, Buddha was concerned with guiding the seeker to realize bliss here and now rather than with academic discussions about God and so forth. Is the study of science, psychology, physiology, etc. helpful for attaining yoga liberation or for intuitive understanding of the unity of reality? Very little. Some theoretical knowledge is needed for yoga and may be found in books. But practical application is what is needed. Personal example and instruction are the most helpful aids. As for intuitive understanding, a person may laboriously convince himself of the truth to be grasped by intuition, of its function and nature, but the actual intuition is more like feeling, and requires practical and personal contact. Mere book learning is not of any great use. After realization, all intellectual loads are useless burdens and are to be thrown overboard. What use? is the learning of those who do not seek to wipe out the letters of destiny from their brow by inquiring. Whence is the birth of us who know the letters? 
they have sunk to the level of a gramophone. Where else are they, O Arunachala? It is those who are not learned that are saved, rather than those whose ego has not yet subsided in spite of their learning. The unlearned are saved from the relentless grip of the devil of self-infatuation. They are saved from the malady of a myriad of whirling thoughts and words. They are saved from running after wealth. It is from more than one evil that they are saved. It is due to illusion born of ignorance that men fail to recognize that which is always and for everybody, the inherent reality dwelling in its natural heart center, and to abide in it, and that instead they argue that it exists or does not exist, that it has form or has not form, or is non-dual or is dual. Can anything appear apart from that which is eternal and perfect? This kind of dispute is endless. Do not engage in it. Instead, turn your mind inward and put an end to all this. There is no finality in disputations. The scriptures serve to indicate the existence of the higher power or self and to point the way to it. That is their essential purpose. Apart from that, they are useless. However, they are voluminous in order to be adapted to the level of development of every seeker. As a man rises in the scale, he finds the stages already attained to be only stepping stones to higher stages, until finally the goal is reached. When that happens, the goal alone remains and everything else, including the scriptures, becomes useless. The intricate maze of philosophy of the various schools is set to clarify matters and to reveal the truth, but in fact it creates confusion where none need exist. To understand anything, there must be the self. The self is obvious, so why not remain as the self? What need to explain the non-self? I was indeed fortunate that I never took to it, my philosophy. Had I taken to it, I would probably be nowhere, but my inherent tendencies led me directly to inquire. Who am I? How fortunate! Is Bhagavan's teaching the same as Shankara's? Bhagavan's teaching is an expression of his own experience and realization. Others find that it tallies with Sri Shankara's. When the Upanishads say that all is Brahman, how can we agree with Shankara that this world is illusory? Shankara also said that this world is Brahman or the Self. What he objected to is one's imagining that the Self is limited by the names and forms that constitute the world. He only said that the world has no reality apart from Brahman. Brahman, or the self, is like a cinema screen, and the world like the pictures on it. You can see the picture only so long as there is a screen, but when the observer himself becomes the screen, only the self remains. Shankara has been criticized for his philosophy of Maya, illusion, without understanding his meaning. He made three statements, that Brahman is real, that the universe is unreal, and that Brahman is the universe. He did not stop with the second. The third statement explains the first two. It signifies that when the universe is perceived apart from Brahman, that perception is false and illusory. What it amounts to is that phenomena are real when experienced as the self, and illusory when seen apart from the self. The self alone exists and is real. The world, the individual, and God, like the illusory appearance of silver in the mother of pearl, imaginary creations in the self, they appear and disappear simultaneously. Actually, the self alone is the world, and I and God. All that exists is only a manifestation of the Supreme. What is reality? Reality must always be real. It has no names or forms, but is what underlies them. It underlies all limitations, being itself limitless. It is not bound in any way. 
it underlies unrealities, being itself real. It is that which is. It is as it is. It transcends speech and is beyond descriptions such as being or non-being. The Buddhists deny the world, whereas Hindu philosophy admits its existence but calls it unreal. Isn't that so? It is only a difference of point of view. They say that the world is created by divine energy, Shakti. Is the knowledge of unreality due to the veiling by illusion, Maya? All admit creation by the divine energy, but what is the nature of this energy? It must be in conformity with the nature of its creation. Are there degrees of illusion? Illusion itself is illusory. It must be seen by somebody outside it. But how can such a seer be subject to it? So how can he speak of degrees of it? You see various scenes passing on a cinema screen. Fire seems to burn buildings to ashes. Water seems to wreck ships. But the screen on which the pictures are projected remains unburnt and dry. Why? Because the pictures are unreal, and the screen is real. Similarly, reflections pass through a mirror, but it is not affected at all by their number or quality. In the same way, the world is a phenomenon upon the substratum of the single reality which is not affected by it in any way. Reality is only one. Talk of illusion is due only to the point of view. Change your point of view to that of knowledge, and you will perceive the universe to be only Brahman. Being now immersed in the world, you see it as a real world. Get beyond it, and it will disappear, and reality alone will remain. The world is perceived as an apparent objective reality when the mind is externalized, thereby abandoning its identity with the self. When the world is thus perceived, the true nature of the self is not revealed. Conversely, when the self is realized, the world ceases to appear as an objective reality. That is illusion, which makes one take what is ever-present and all-pervasive full to perfection and self-luminous and is indeed the self in the core of one's being for non-existent and unreal. Conversely, that is illusion, which makes one take for real and self-existent what is non-existent and unreal, namely the trilogy of world, ego, and God. To those who have not realized the self as well as to those who have, the world is real. But to the former, truth is adapted to the form of the world, whereas to the latter, truth shines as the formless perfection and the substratum of the world. This is the only difference between them. Sometimes you say that the imaginary and the real are the same. I do not understand. Yes, I do sometimes say that. What do you mean by real? What is it that you call real? According to the Vedanta, only that which is permanent and unchanging can be called real. That is the meaning of reality. The names and forms which constitute the world continually change and perish and are therefore called unreal. It is unreal, imaginary, to limit the self to these names and forms and real to regard all as the self. The non-dualist says that the world is unreal. But he also says, all this is Brahman. So it is clear that what he condemns is regarding the world as objectively real in itself, not regarding it as Brahman. He who sees the self sees the self alone in the world also. It is immaterial to the enlightened, whether the world appears or not. In any case, his attention is turned to the self. It is the letters and the paper on which they are printed. You are so engrossed in the letters that you forget about the paper. But the enlightened sees the paper as the substratum whether the letters appear on it or not. The Vedantins do not say that the world is unreal. That is a misunderstanding. If they did, what would be the meaning of the Vedantic text? All this is Brahman. 
They only mean that the world is unreal as world, but real as self. If you regard the world as non-self, it is not real. Everything, whether you call it illusion, maya, or divine play, lila, or energy, shakti, must be within the self and not apart from it. The Vedas contain conflicting accounts of cosmogony. Ether is said to be the first creation in one place, vital energy in another, water in another, something else in another. How can all this be reconciled? Does it not impair the credibility of the Vedas? Different seers saw different aspects of truth at different times, each emphasizing some viewpoint. Why do you worry about their conflicting statements? The essential aim of the Vedas is to teach us the nature of the imperishable self and show us that we are that. About that part I am satisfied. Then treat all the rest as auxiliary arguments or as expositions for the ignorant who want to know the origin of things. I'm copying out the English translation of the Tamil, Kaivalya Navanitha, and I've come across some of the technical terms in which I have difficulty in understanding. Can you help me? These portions deal with theories of creation. They are not essential because the real purpose of the scriptures is not to set forth such theories. They mention the theories, casually, so that those readers who wish to may take interest in them. The truth is that the world appears as a passing shadow in a flood of light. Light is necessary even to see the shadow. The shadow is not worth any special study, analysis, or discussion. The purpose of the book is to deal with the self, and what is said about creation may be omitted for the present. Vedanta says that the cosmos springs into view simultaneously with him who sees it, and there is no detailed process of creation. It is similar to a dream where he who experiences the dream arises simultaneously with the dream he experiences. However, some people cling so fast to objective knowledge that they are not satisfied when told this. They want to know how sudden creation can be possible, and argue that an effect must be preceded by a cause. In fact, they desire an explanation of the world that they see about them. Therefore, the scriptures try to satisfy their curiosity by such theories. This method of dealing with the subject is called the theory of gradual creation. But the true spiritual seeker can be satisfied with instantaneous creation. The individual being, which identifies its existence with that of life and the physical body as I, is called the ego, the self which is pure consciousness, has no ego sense about it. Neither can the physical body, which is inert in itself, have this ego sense. Between the two, that is between the self or pure consciousness and the inert physical body, there arises mysteriously the ego sense or I notion, the hybrid which is neither of them, and this flourishes as an individual being. This ego or individual being is at the root of all that is futile and undesirable in life. Therefore, it is to be destroyed by any possible means. Then that which ever is alone remains resplendent. This is liberation, or enlightenment, or self-realization. Bhagavan often says the world is not outside you, or everything depends on you, or what is there outside you. I find all this puzzling. The world existed before I was born and will continue to exist after my death, as it has survived the death of so many who once lived as I do now. Did I ever say that the world exists because of you? I have only put to you the question, what exists apart from yourself? You ought to understand that by the self, neither the physical body nor the subtle body is meant. What you are told is that if you once know the self within which all ideas exist, not excluding the idea of yourself, of others like you and of the world, you can realize the truth that there is a reality 
a supreme truth which is the self of all the world you now see, the self of all the selves, the one real, the supreme, the eternal self, as distinct from the ego or individual being, which is impermanent. You must not mistake the ego or the bodily idea for the self. Then Bhagavan means that the self is God? You see the difficulty. Self-inquiry, who am I, is a different technique from the meditation, I am Siva, or I am He. I rather emphasize self-knowledge, for you are first concerned with yourself, before you proceed to know the world or its Lord. The I am He, or I am Brahman, meditation is more or less mental, but the quest for the self of which I speak is a direct method, and is superior to it. For the moment, you get into the quest for the self and begin to go deeper. The real self is waiting there to receive you, and then whatever is to be done is done by something else, and you, as an individual, have no hand in it. In this process, all doubts and discussions are automatically given up, just as one who sleeps forgets all his cares for the time being. What certainty is there that something awaits there to receive me? When a person is sufficiently mature, he becomes convinced, naturally. How is this maturity to be attained? Various ways are prescribed, but whatever previous development there may be, earnest self-inquiry hastens it. That is arguing in a circle. I am strong enough for the quest if I am mature, and it is the quest that makes me mature. The mind does not have this sort of difficulty. It wants a fixed theory to satisfy itself with. Really, however, no theory is necessary for the man who seriously strives to approach God or his true self. Everyone is the self, and indeed is infinite. Yet each person mistakes his body for his self. In order to know anything, illumination is necessary. This can only be of the nature of light. However, it lights up both physical light and physical darkness. That is to say that it lies beyond apparent light and darkness. It is itself neither. But it is said to be light because it illumines both. It is infinite and it is consciousness. Consciousness is the self of which everyone is aware. No one is ever away from the self, and therefore everyone is, in fact, self-realized. Only, and this is the great mystery, people do not know this and want to realize the self. Realization consists only in getting rid of the false idea that one is not realized. It is not anything new to be acquired. It must already exist or would not be eternal, and only what is eternal is worth striving for. Once the false notion, I am the body or I am not realized, has been removed, supreme consciousness or the self alone remains, and in people's present state of knowledge, they call this realization. But the truth is that realization is eternal and already exists here and now. Consciousness is pure knowledge. The mind arises out of it and is made up of thoughts. The essence of the mind is only awareness or consciousness. However, the ego overclouds it. It functions as reasoning, thinking, or perceiving. The universal mind, not being limited by the ego, has nothing outside itself and is therefore only aware. This is what the Bible means by I am that I am. The ego-ridden mind has its strength sapped and is too weak to resist distressing thoughts. The egoless mind is happy, and we see in deep, dreamless sleep. Clearly, therefore, happiness and distress are only modes of the mind. When I seek the I, I see nothing. You say that because you are accustomed to identify yourself with the body and sight with the eyes. But what is there to be seen, and by whom, and how? There is only one consciousness, and this when it identifies itself with the body, 
projects itself through the eyes and sees the surrounding objects. The individual is limited to the waking state. He expects to see something different and accepts the authority of his senses. He will not admit that he who sees the objects seen and the act of seeing are all manifestations of the same consciousness. The I, I. Meditation helps to overcome the illusion that the self is something to see. Actually, there is nothing to see. How do you recognize yourself now? Do you have to hold a mirror up in front of yourself to recognize yourself? The awareness itself is the I. Realize it. And that is the truth. When I inquire into the origin of thoughts, there is the perception of the I, but it does not satisfy me. Quite right, because this perception of I is associated with the form, perhaps with the physical body. Nothing should be associated with the pure self. The self is the pure reality in whose light the body, the ego, and all else shine. When all thoughts are stilled, pure consciousness remains over. How did the ego arise? There is no ego. If there were, you would have to admit of two selves in you. Therefore, there is no ignorance. If you inquire into the self, ignorance, which is already non-existent, will be found not to exist. And you will say that it is fled. Absence of thought does not mean a blank. There must be someone to be aware of that blank. Knowledge and ignorance pertain only to the mind and are in duality, but the self is beyond them both. It is pure light. There is no need for one self to see another. There are no two selves. What is not the self is mere non-self and cannot see the self. The self has no sight or hearing. It lies beyond them. All alone is pure consciousness. I don't know whether the self is different from the ego. In what state were you in deep sleep? I don't know. Who doesn't know? The waking self? But you don't deny that you existed while in deep sleep. I was and am, but I don't know who was in deep sleep. Exactly. The waking man says that he did not know anything in the state of deep sleep. Now he sees objects and knows that he exists, but in deep sleep there were no objects and no spectator. And yet the same person who is speaking now existed in deep sleep also. What is the difference between the two states? There are objects and the play of senses now, while in deep sleep there were not. A new entity, the ego, has arisen. It acts through the senses sees objects, confuses itself with the body, and claims to be the self. In reality, what was in deep sleep continues to be now also. The self is changeless. It is the ego which has come between. That which rises and sets is the ego. That which remains changeless is the self. Waking, dream, and sleep are mere faces of the mind, not of the self. The self is the witness of these three states. Your true nature exists in sleep. But we are advised not to fall asleep during meditation. It is stupor which you must guard against. That sleep which alternates with waking is not the true sleep. That waking which alternates with sleep is not the true waking. Are you awake now? No, what you have to do is to wake up to your true state. You should neither fall into false sleep, nor remain falsely awake. Though present even in sleep, the self is not then perceived. It cannot be known in sleep straight away. It must first be realized in the waking state, for it is our true nature underlying all the three states. Effort must be made in the waking state and the self realized here and now. It will then be understood to be the continuous self uninterrupted by the alteration of waking, dream, and deep sleep.
Do a person's actions in this life affect him in future births? Are you born now? Why do you think of future births? The truth is that there is neither birth nor death. Let him who is born think of death and palliatives for it. Is the Hindu doctrine of reincarnation right? No definite answer is possible. Even the present incarnation is denied. For instance, in the Bhagavad Gita, isn't our personality beginningless? Find out first whether it exists at all. And after you have solved that problem, ask the question. Namawar says, In ignorance, I took the ego to be the self. But with right knowledge, the ego is not. And only you remain as the self. Both the non dualist and the dualist agree on the necessity for self realization. Attain that first and then raise other questions. Non dualism or dualism cannot be decided on theoretical grounds alone. If the self is realized, the question will not arise. Whatever is born must die. Whatever is acquired must be lost. But were you born? You are eternally existent. The self can never be lost. They say that we have the choice of enjoying merit or demerit after our death, that it depends on our choice which comes. Is that so? Why raise questions of what happens after death? Why ask whether you were born, whether you are reaping the fruits of your past karma, and so on? You will not raise such questions in a little while when you fall asleep. Why? Are you a different person now from the one you are when you are asleep? No, you are not. Find out why such questions do not occur to you when you are asleep. In the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna first says to Arjuna in chapter 2 that no one was born, and then in chapter 4 there have been numerous incarnations, both of you and me. I know them, but you do not. Which of these two statements is true? The teaching varies according to the understanding of the listener. When Arjuna said that he would not fight against his relatives and elders in order to kill them and gain the kingdom, Sri Krishna said, Not that these, you or I, were not before, are not now, nor will be hereafter. None was born, none has died nor will it be so hereafter. He further developed this theme, saying that he had given instructions to the son and through him to Ikshvaku. And Arjuna queried how that could be, since he had been born only a few years back while they lived ages ago. Then Sri Krishna saw his point of view and said, Yes, there have been many incarnations of me and you. I know them all. You do not. Such statements appear contradictory, but they are true according to the viewpoint of the questioner. Christ also said, Before Abraham was I am. Just as in dreams you wake up after several new experiences, so after death another body is found. Just as rivers lose their individuality when they discharge their waters into the ocean, and yet the waters evaporate and return as rain on the hills, and back again through the rivers to the ocean. So also individuals lose their individuality when they go to sleep, but return again, according to their previous innate tendencies. Similarly in death also, being is not lost. How can that be? See how a tree grows again when its branches are cut off, so long as the life source is not destroyed, it will grow. Similarly, latent potentialities withdrawn into the heart at death, but do not perish. That is how beings are reborn. In truth, there is neither seed nor tree. There is only being. How long is the interval between death and rebirth? <laughs> it may be long or short. But a realized man undergoes no such changes. He merges into the infinite being, as is said 
in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. Some say that those who after death take the path of light are not reborn, whereas those who take the path of darkness are born after they have reaped their karma, self-made destiny, in their subtle bodies. If a man's merits and demerits are equal, he is reborn and immediately on earth. If the merits outweigh the demerits, his subtle body goes first to heaven, while if the demerits outweigh the merits, it goes first to hell. But in either case, he is later reborn on earth. All this is described in the scriptures, but in fact there is neither birth nor death. One simply remains what one really is. That is the only truth. God, in his mercy withholds this knowledge from people. If they knew that they had been virtuous, they would grow proud, and in the other case they would be despondent. Both are bad. It is enough to know the self. A competent person who has already, perhaps, in a previous incarnation qualified himself, realizes the truth, and abides in peace as soon as he hears it told to him just once, whereas one who is not so qualified has to pass through the various stages before attaining samadhi, direct, pure consciousness of being. That is to say that a lifetime may be regarded as a day's journey upon the pilgrimage to self-realization. How far from the goal one starts depends on the effort or lack of effort made on the previous days. How far forward one advances depends on the effort of today. A science lecturer from a university asked whether the intellect survives a man's death and was told, Why think of death? Consider what happens in your sleep. What is your experience of that? But sleep is transient, whereas death is not. Sleep is intermediate between two waking states. And in the same way, death is intermediate between two births. Both are transient. I mean, when the spirit is disembodied, does it carry the intellect with it? The spirit is not disembodied. The bodies differ. If not a gross body, it will be a subtle one, as in sleep, dream, or daydream. Is the Buddhist view that there is no continuous entity answering to the idea of the individual soul right or not? Is this consistent with the Hindu doctrine of a reincarnating ego? Is the soul a continuous entity which reincarnates again and again, according to the Hindu doctrine, or is it a mere conglomeration of mental tendencies? The real self is continuous and unaffected. The reincarnating ego belongs to a lower plane, that of thought. It is transcended by self-realization. Reincarnations are due to a spurious offshoot of being and are therefore denied by the Buddhist. The human state is due to a mingling of the sentient with the insentient. Is it possible to know the posthumous state of an individual? It is possible, but why try? Such facts are only as real as the person who seeks them. The birth of a person and his life and death are real to us. Because you wrongly identify yourself with the body, you think of the other also as a body. Neither you nor he is the body. But from my level of understanding, I regard myself and my son as real. The birth of the I thought is a person's birth, and its death is his death. After the I-thought has arisen, the wrong identification with the body arises. Identifying oneself with the body makes you falsely identify others also with their bodies. Just as your body was born and grows and will die, so you think the other also was born, grew, and died. Did you think of your son before he was born? The thought came after his birth and continues, even after his death. He is your son only in so far as you think of him. Where has he gone? To the source from which he sprang. 
So long as you continue to exist, he does too. But if you cease to identify yourself with the body and realize the true self, this confusion will vanish. You are eternal, and others also will be found to be eternal. Until this is realized, there will always be grief due to false values which are caused by wrong knowledge and wrong identification. On the death of King George V, two devotees were discussing the matter in the hall and seemed upset. Bhagavan said, What is it to you who dies or is lost? Die yourself and be lost, becoming one with the self of all. Even if I cannot realize in my lifetime, let me have a glimpse of reality at least at the moment of death, so that it may stand in me in good stead in the future. It is said in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 8, that whatever is a person's last thought at death determines his next birth. But it is necessary to experience reality now, in this life, in order to experience it at death. Consider whether this present moment is any different from the last one at death and try to be in the desired state. Why do you say that the heart is on the right when biologists have found it to be on the left? What authority have you? No one denies that the physical organ is on the left, but the heart of which I speak is on the right. That is my experience and I require no authority for it. Still, you can find confirmation of it in a Malayali book on Ayurveda, in the Sita Upanishad. Why do we have a place such as the heart to concentrate on for meditation? Because you seek true consciousness. Where can you find it? Can you attain it outside yourself? You have to find it internally. Therefore, you are directed inward. The heart is the seat of consciousness, or consciousness itself. I ask you to observe where the eye arises in your body, but it is not really quite correct to say that the eye arises from and merges in the chest at the right side. The heart is another name for reality, and this is neither inside nor outside the body. There can be no in or out for it, since it alone is. I do not mean by heart, any physiological organ or plexus of nerves or anything like that. But so long as a man identifies himself with the body or thinks he is in the body, he is advised to see where in the body the I-thought arises and merges again. It must be the heart at the right side of the chest since every man of whatever race and religion and in whatever language he may be speaking points to the right side of the chest to indicate himself when he says I. This is so all over the world, so that must be the place. And by keenly watching the emergence of the eye thought on waking and its subsidence on going to sleep, one can see that it is in the heart on the right side. When a room is dark, you need a lamp to light it. But when the sun rises, there is no need for a lamp. Objects are seen without one. And to see the sun itself, no lamp is needed because it is self-luminous. Similarly with the mind. The reflected light of the mind is necessary to perceive objects, but to see the heart. It is enough for the mind to be turned towards it. Then the mind loses itself, and the heart shines forth. There are said to be six subtle organs of different colors in the chest, of which the spiritual heart is said to be the one situated two fingers' breadth to the right from the center. But the heart is also said to be formless. Does that mean that we should imagine it to have a form and meditate on this? No. Only the quest, who am I, is necessary. That which continues to exist throughout sleep and waking is the same being in both. But while waking there is unhappiness, and therefore the effort to remove it. When asked who awakes from sleep, you say I. Hold fast to this I. If that is done, the eternal being reveals itself. 
The most important thing is the investigation of the eye and not concentration on the heart center. There is no such thing as the inner and the outer. Both words mean the same or nothing at all. Nevertheless, there is also the practice of concentration on the heart center, which is a form of spiritual exercise. Only he who concentrates on the heart can remain aware when the mind ceases to be active and remain still, with no thoughts, whereas those who concentrate on any other center cannot retain awareness without thought, but only infer that the mind was still after it has become active again. Thoughts suddenly cease, and I, I rises up equally and suddenly, and continues. It's only a feeling, not a thought. Can it be right? Yes, it is right. Thoughts have to cease and reason to disappear, for the I, I to rise up and be felt. Feeling is the main thing, not reason. Moreover, it is not in the head, but at the right side of the chest. That is where it should be, because the heart is there. When I look outwards, it disappears. What should I do? Hold fast to it. The bliss of self is always yours, and you will find it if you seek it earnestly. The cause of your misery is not in your outer life. It is in you, as your ego. You impose limitations on yourself and then make a vain struggle to transcend them. All unhappiness is due to the ego. With it comes all your trouble. What does it avail you to attribute the cause of misery to the happenings of life when that cause is really within you? What can happiness get you from these things extraneous to yourself? When you get it, how long will it last? If you would deny the ego and scorch it by ignoring it, you would be free. If you accept it, it will impose limitations on you and throw you into a vain struggle to transcend them. That was how the thief sought to ruin King Janaka. To be the self that you really are is the only means to realize the bliss that is ever yours. A very devoted and simple devotee had lost his only son, a child of three. The next day he arrived at the ashram with his family. Training of mind helps one to bear sorrows and bereavements with courage. But the loss of one's children is said to be the worst of all griefs. Grief only exists as long as one considers oneself to have a definite form. If the form is transcended, one knows the oneself to be eternal. There is neither death nor birth. What is born is only the body, and this is the creation of the ego. But the ego is not ordinarily perceived without the body, and so is identified with it. It is thought that matters. Let the sensible man consider whether he knew his body while in deep sleep. Why then does he feel it in the waking state? Although the body was not felt in sleep, did not the self exist? What was his state when in deep sleep? And what is it now when awake? What is the difference? The ego rises up and that is waking. Simultaneously, thoughts arise. Find out who has the thoughts. Where do they come from? They must arise from the conscious self. Apprehending this even vaguely helps towards the extinction of the ego. The realization of the one infinite existence becomes possible. In that state, there are no individuals but only eternal being. Hence, there is no thought of death or grieving. If a man thinks that he is born, he cannot escape the fear of death. Let him find out whether he was ever born or whether the self takes birth. He will discover that the self always exists and that the body which is born resolves itself into thought and that the emergence of thought is the root of all mischief. Find where thought comes from and then you will abide in the ever-present inmost self and be free from the idea of birth 
and the fear of death. If someone we love dies, it causes grief. Should we avoid such grief by either loving all alike or not loving at all? If someone we love dies, it causes grief to the one who continues living. The way to get rid of grief is not to continue living. Kill the griever, and who would then remain to grieve? The ego must die. That is the only way. The two alternatives you suggest amount to the same. When all are realized to be the one self, who is there to love or hate? Widespread distress, such as famine, pestilence, spreads havoc in the world. What is the cause of this state of affairs? To whom does all this appear? That won't do. I see misery all around. You are not conscious of the world and its suffering while asleep, but you are now that you are awake. Continue in the state in which you are not affected by such things. When you are not aware of the world, that is to say when you remain as the self in the state of sleep, its sufferings do not affect you. Therefore turn inwards and seek the self, and there will be an end both of the world and of its miseries. But that is selfishness. The world is not external to you. Because you wrongly identify yourself with the body, you see the world outside you, and its sufferings become apparent to you. But the world and its sufferings are not real. Seek the reality and get rid of this unreal feeling. There are great men and public workers who cannot solve the problem of suffering in the world. That is because they are based on the ego. If they remained in the self, it would be different. Why don't Mahatmas help? How do you know that they don't? Public speeches, outer activity and material help are all outweighed by the silence of the Mahatmas. They accomplish more than others. What can we do to ameliorate the condition of the world? If you remain free from pain, there will be no pain anywhere. The trouble now is due to your seeing the world outside yourself and thinking there is pain in it. But both the world and the pain are within you. If you turn inwards, there will be no pain. God is perfect. Why did he create the world imperfect? A work partakes of the nature of its author, but in this case it is not so. Are you something separate from God that you should ask this question? So long as you consider yourself the body, you see the world as external to you. It is to you that the imperfection appears. God is perfection, and his work is also perfection. But you see it as imperfect because of your wrong identification with the body or the ego. Why did the self manifest as this miserable world? In order that you might seek it, your eyes cannot see themselves, but if you hold a mirror in front of them, they see themselves. Creation is the mirror. See yourself first, and then see the whole world as the self. Then what it amounts to is that I should always turn inwards. Yes. Shouldn't I see the world at all? You are not told to shut your eyes to the world, but only to see yourself first, and then see the whole world as the self. If you consider yourself as the body, the world appears to be external. If you are the self, the world appears as Brahman, manifested. I have a toothache. Is that only a thought? Yes. Then why can't I think that there is no toothache and so cure myself? One does not feel the toothache when one is absorbed in other thoughts or when asleep. But it still remains. So strong is man's conviction of the reality of the world that it is not easily shaken off. But the world is no more real than the individual who sees it. At present, there is a Sino-Japanese war going on. If it is only in the imagination, can or will Sri Bhagavan imagine it not to be going on and so put an end to it? The Bhagavan of the questioner, whom the questioner sees as an external being, is as much a thought of his as the Sino-Japanese war. But why should there be suffering now? 
If there is no suffering, how could the desire to be happy arise? If that desire did not arise, how could the quest of the self arise? Then is all suffering good? Yes. What is happiness? It is a healthy and handsome body, regular meals, and so on. Even an emperor has endless troubles, although he may be in good health. So all suffering is due to the false notion, I am the body. Getting rid of this is knowledge. <laughs>